Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So, today I'm going to be sharing with you my first video in my Data Science for Healthcare tutorial series. I'll be teaching you the key skills you need to know to become a healthcare data scientist. Let's start the video. Welcome to our first video on my Data Science for Healthcare tutorial series. In this series, we're going to be using real healthcare problems and medical data sets to teach you how you can leverage the amazing skill of programming and data science to make the most of your healthcare career. In these first few videos, I'm going to be starting on some Python fundamentals, just to make sure we're all starting from the same page. We'll be using Jupyter Notebooks, which is an open source platform that allows you to write and share documents with live code, equations and advanced visualizations, and is an industry standard within the field of data science. Today, we're going to be learning about basic arithmetic and operators in Python, as well as types and type conversion. If you're familiar with Python, I'd suggest skipping ahead a few videos because we're just going to be going through the basics of Python at this stage to make sure everyone's on the same level. However, if you're new to coding in Python, this is a great place to start. Let's jump into the video. First, we need to download Python. As most of you, I imagine, are new to Python, I highly recommend you download it using the Anaconda distribution. This will automatically download the latest Python release as well as lots of useful libraries for data science. It also gives you the Anaconda Navigator, which makes it much easier to work with Jupyter Notebooks. To do this, head over to the Anaconda website. The link is in the description at the bottom of this video. Scroll down to the Anaconda installers and download the appropriate version depending on what operating system you're using, and complete the installation process. Once that's downloaded, start up the Anaconda Navigator. This will give you a screen that looks like this. Press the launch button under where it says Jupyter Notebook. This will open up a new Jupyter Notebook in your web browser. Later on in the series, we'll discuss more about all the amazing things you can do with the Jupyter Notebook. But for now, I want to get you starting to code. So let's start a blank notebook by clicking on the new button in the top right of the screen and click on Python 3. This will open up a blank Python notebook. Jupyter Notebooks are split into cells that can contain both code and text. Text is written as Markdown. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. It's just a way of formatting text online. You don't need to know it for these tutorials, but if you are interested, I'll include a link in the description of where you can learn more. The code in a notebook can be in loads of different languages, but as we started a Python notebook here, the code has to be in Python. OK, so let's get started with some basic operators in Python. Arithmetic operators can be used to add, subtract, divide, and multiply together numbers in Python. The operator for addition is a plus sign. To subtract, it's a minus sign. Division is a forward slash, and multiplication is an asterisk. There is an operator for exponentiation, so multiplying a number by itself n times. You may expect this to be a wedge symbol, but it's not. It's actually two asterisks together without a space. Let's go back to our notebook and try these out. So let's add two numbers together by using the addition operator. In order to run the expression within this cell, press Ctrl and Enter. By running the cell, we can see the result of our expression below the cell and we can see that's worked because it's returned the sum of 20 and 10. Now let's subtract two numbers by using the subtraction operator and run the cell again. Now we can see the output of our new expression. Let's do the same with division and multiplication and finally exponentiation. You might have noticed that the cell is only returning the output of the final operation within the cell and that's because the cell is only returning the output of the last operation it performs. However, this isn't always the behavior we want, and there are often times you want to return the result of multiple expressions from within the same cell. We can do this using something called the print function. The print function is one of the many functions that comes with the Python programming language. All languages have its equivalent. All it does is tell the program to print something to the user running the program. The print function looks like this, the word print with an open and closed bracket at the end. The print statement will print out the result of whatever expression is between the brackets. So if we were to write this expression, we would see the number 20 printed to the screen. Let's try this with our code in the notebook. If we rewrite the code above and wrap each equation in a curly bracket of the print statement, let's see what output we'd now get. Great, so now we can see we're getting the output of each expression, rather than just the output from the last expression. A very important concept in programming is variables. Variables are just a place to store some information. Rather than redoing the equations, sometimes we'll want to store the result of an equation to use later. Think of your computer memory like a grid. In each section of the grid, we can store some information. So if I wanted to store the result of the equation 10 plus 20 to use later, I could store this in a section of the grid. But how can I access it? Well, this is where the variable name comes in. By assigning the result of that equation to a variable name, I can now access that information from memory by using the variable name. It is important to note that the equals sign does not actually mean equals in this context. It is the assignment operator, 
All this means is that the result of the expression on the right of the assignment operator is assigned to the variable name to the left of the operator. Let's try this out in our Jupyter Notebook. Let's create a variable called result and assign the result of a simple calculation to that. Now, rather than printing this calculation, let's see what happens if we print the variable to the console. Here we can see 30 has been stored within the variable, result. And by printing this to the screen, we can see the value of that variable. We can also use variables within calculations themselves. Let's create another variable here called other result and assign it the result of adding 50 to our original variable which we defined above. Now let's print the value of our original variable and new variable to the screen. Here we can see that the original variable has not changed, but the new variable is the sum of 50 and our original variable. If we wanted to change the original variable's value, rather than creating a new variable and storing the result in that, then we simply have to use the original variable's name at the left of the assignment operator. Let's see what happens if we print this out to the screen. And here we can see the variable has been updated. As the code on the right hand side of the operator is happening before the value is assigned, then the value of the result variable in the equation is still 30, as this was assigned up here. However, the same variable is being reassigned here with the new value. And so when we print this out, we can see its updated value. This is exactly why these are called variables, because their stored value can change, and so they are variable. Next, let's talk about syntax shortcuts. Syntax shortcuts are just a shorthand for performing operations when updating variables. Say we have a variable x that equals 10. Now, I want to add 10 to that number. We could write it out as x equals x plus 10, but there is a shorthand way of doing this. Instead of writing it out in full, I could simply write x plus equals 10. This means exactly the same, but uses a shorthand operator instead of writing out the whole equation. There are shorthand operators for all the basic arithmetic operators, and they follow the same pattern. Let's try them out in our Jupyter Notebook. Here I've written out the different shorthands for each operation. If we print this to the screen, we can see that each of the variables has been updated using the shorthand operator. If you want, you can pause the video here so you can try these out for yourself. Next, let's talk about types. Variables have different types. We've met one type already, the integer. An integer is effectively a number without a decimal point. We're going to talk about three other basic types in this video, a float, string, and a boolean. A float stands for a floating point number, and it is effectively any number with a decimal point in it. The decimal point in the number is the floating point. This has to be stored as a separate type, as an integer cannot understand a number with a decimal point in it. The next type is called a string. A string is a sequence of characters. This is used to store text data in Python. More on these later. And finally, a boolean. A boolean can only be true or false. It is an all or nothing variable and can be used to store a conditional result when there is only two possible outcomes. You'll learn more about these variable types and how they can be used as we go through this tutorial series. Here we can see the different variables written out in our Jupyter Notebook. I've wrapped them in the type function. The type function will return the type of whatever is written within the curly brackets. So, if we run this cell, we can see that each type is printed out below. It's also possible to convert between types. We can convert between types by casting the variable to another type. Say we have the value 10, and we want to convert that value to being a float. We can do this by wrapping the integer in the float function. This will return our integer as a floating point number. I can do the same converting floats to integers by wrapping the number in the int function. However, as an integer cannot have a decimal point within it, you will lose the information after the decimal point. We can even convert strings to integers, and vice versa, using the integer and string casting function. In this cell, I have written out the conversions we have talked about. And if we run these cells, you can see that the type is being appropriately converted. You may have spotted a problem with this conversion that occurs when converting a float to an integer. Because the information on the right hand side of the decimal point is lost, the number is not rounded when converting. If we want to convert the number to an integer, but round it appropriately, we need to use the round function. Using the round function will round the number to the nearest integer, as we can see here. It's important to note that using the round function with a variable will not change the original value unless we reassign it. Here we can see the rounded number is printed to the screen, but if we then print the original variable, nothing has changed. To update the original variable, we need to make sure we reassign it to the new rounded value. You can do this using the assignment operator. Now we can see because we reassign the variable to the rounded value, the variable is now storing the updated value. We've touched on strings when discussing types, but we need to cover them in a bit more detail. A string is defined using single or double quotation marks, otherwise Python can't recognize the text as a string. Strings are the only way of storing text data, so you'll be using them a lot. 
However, you might already have spotted a problem with declaring strings. What if we want to have an apostrophe or quotation mark in our string? Having an apostrophe or a double quotation within a string that is declared using the same symbol will make Python think that the string has finished early. Fortunately, this is easy to solve by changing the symbol we use to declare the string. But what if we have an apostrophe and a double quotation mark in our string, like we have here? We can't use double quotation marks as it will terminate the string early, and the same happens if we use single quotation marks. We can get around this by using something called an escape key. The escape key is a backslash, and by placing it in front of our apostrophe, we are telling Python to ignore the apostrophe in the string, and therefore not terminate the string early. Let's try this in our notebook. Here we have an invalid string, because the string is being terminated early. If we run this, you'll see that we get an error, because our code after this point doesn't make any sense in Python. Let's try adding the escape character in front of our apostrophe. If we now run this code, we can see the error has gone and the string is returned. Note the apostrophe is still there, but the escape character is not. This is because the escape character's purpose is to remove the syntactic function of the next character in the string, but it is not considered a part of the string. We can add strings together in much the same way we add numbers together. Let's try adding string A and string B together. If we now run this cell, we can see that the strings have been concatenated. However, they are not formatted as we would like. You can fix this by simply adding an extra connecting string to this expression, like this. If we run this again, we can now see that the string is appropriately formatted and much more readable. One last thing we need to discuss, commenting. You may have noticed that within the cells in the notebook, I've added some text explaining the code in the cell. But why is the program not reading this as code? This is known as a comment in programming, and it is a very good habit to get into early in your programming career. Comments are declared using a hashtag in Python. This tells Python to ignore this line of text when running the program. Comments are used as an aid memoir to yourself, as well as a signpost to other developers. As your code gets more and more complex, the code can become difficult to read. Splitting it up with comments can be a great way to help other developers understand the purpose of each part of your code. Well done for making it to the end of our tutorial. Each week, we're going to be doing a different medical related challenge to test what you've learnt. You can find the notebook file for each week by following the link in the description below. At the bottom of the notebook will be the challenge for you to solve. The solution will be in the next video of this series. For this week's challenge, I want you to use the variables below to print to the screen. Jane Doe takes propanolol 40 milligrams four times a day. Total dose in one day is 160 milligrams. You need to use all of the variables to create this string, and the return string should change if you update the value of any of the variables. A big part of coding is learning how to find help when you're unsure of what to do, and the online coding community is fantastic for this. So, if you get stuck, don't give up. Search online for help with your problem, or pop a comment below on this video and I'll give you a little helping hand. Good luck guys, and happy deving! Thanks for watching guys, make sure you click the like button if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe to my channel to get all my content. If all of this was new to you, make sure you go through this video a couple of times just to make sure all those concepts are cemented before we move on to the next video. In the next video, we'll go through some more fundamental concepts in Python, including if statements, lists, and for loops. We'll also go through the solution to this week's challenge. If you enjoyed this week's video, make sure to check some of my other stuff. It should be over here on the left somewhere. Left, right, left. My left, your right. See you in the next video, guys, and as always, happy deving.